Good morning. I greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I bring you greetings on behalf of your brothers and sisters in the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta. 75 and a half counties, 117 worshiping communities, more than 56,000 men, women, children, teenagers, and feisty seniors. <laughs> one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's a delight to be here with you and to be with my friend uh, Chuck and to meet a new colleague, Father Santi, and, uh, and so many of you over the last day or so uh, in, our, uh, in our series uh, talking about Jesus in the real uh, world. And I want to keep that conversation going even with this sermon. So let me start here. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, does anybody here have a cell phone? A few of you? You got a cell phone. Okay, that's refreshing. Okay, so, so if your cell phone is like my cell phone, then every once in a while, uh, something called memories pops up. Is that right? Have I got that right? All right, y'all are sitting in the front. You're going to have to help me preach this sermon, all right? <laughs> so, so I get these memories, and, and, and I don't trigger them, and I don't initiate them, but they, they pop up, and, and oftentimes they're good memories, and they're, they're refreshing. Good meals, family photos, trips, etc. They, those, those, they're refreshing. I'm refreshed by those memories. And I think to myself oftentimes when I see those memories, boy, ain't God good. Ain't God good. Uh, today's lessons are, are, if you can sort of bring your 21st century uh, mind to today's lessons, all we have in front of us today uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Gospel, are, are memories popping up. In, in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, Isaiah's memory. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, St. Paul's memories popping up. Uh, and in the Gospel of Luke, James and John and Simon, memories popping up. Popping up about what? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> popping up about how God has shown up in their lives and how they responded to the intervening goodness of God in the real world. That's all I'm talking about today. Evelyn Underhill, a great author, said once that all, the only thing that's interesting in the church, and she said this to a House of Bishops meeting, she said, the only thing that is interesting in the church, my dear Lord Bishops, is God. God is the only thing that is interesting in the church. I mean, we gather uh, for lots of reasons, and those are all good reasons, but the, the, the reason with the most majesty the most power, the most sustaining force is the fact that you and I have been gathered from wherever we have been gathered to continue to tend to the God story. None of us have it mastered. None of us know it all. Some of us have been in church our whole lives, and we don't have the thing under control, but we have our part of it. Isn't that right? We have our part of it, and my part is not your part, and your part is not my part, but, but we need all the parts to begin to talk about this God that is good, a God that is real, able, good, and generous. You know, one of the great limitations of church, as I said the other day, is that only one little big mouth gets to talk on most Sundays. And, and I think the most imaginative way I can think about church down the road in some configuration is if you got a chance to tell your story. Some part of your story about how God has shown up in your real life. Now, Episcopalians immediately get nervous when you start talking that way, right? But maybe we ought to leave the shallow waters, as the Luke's Gospel say today, and begin to move out into the deep water. You know, we're living in a deep water time, have you noticed? This is a deep water time. We do not have the luxury to be coy about the God we love but are afraid to love too much because the world needs increasing witnesses, right, to how this God is showing up in people's real life. When last have you heard from God? What does your spiritual photo album look like? Yeah, what's that 
thing, that event, that occurrence, that intervention that you go back to again and again and you draw strength from to live these days. That's what all this is about. The funny outfits, the windows, the sacrament, that's all it's about. Sustaining us on this journey with a God that is close. So that you and I can draw from that, not only for ourselves, but for the world that God loves so wonderfully well. And so much. Yeah. In Isaiah's little snapshot memory, what do we get? He just drug it into church one Sunday. Anybody know about that? Just barely made it over the threshold, didn't have the wherewithal or the power to sing because the world's in a shambles. Uzziah has died. His political sort of figure, preferred political figure has died now. Hello, somebody. And now the world makes no sense. He's disoriented. And he just plops down and he hopes the preacher's going to say something that will positively impact that. But in the majesty of the worship and the beauty of the singing, the temple architecture, somehow he sees God afresh. He's been sitting in that pew all his life, but somehow he sees God afresh now. And not only that, he sees God high and lifted up. High and lifted up above partisan politics. High and lifted up beyond his anxieties. High and lifted up beyond the worst headline. High and lifted up beyond his worst day, his worst decision, or his worst deed. High and lifted up. And now, everything gets dynamic. Somehow, he realizes that there's something more than his guilt more than his shame that is calling him forward. In fact, that can put his guilt and shame to rest. That's what the lesson says. And the only thing that Isaiah gets to do is respond. 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 Sometimes we want to make God a project, don't we? If there's any spiritual competency we need to sort of develop is just stand here and feel that breath that you have no control over and realize that it's grace. My wife is from Jamaica, and we, last time we were at the beach, you know, I'm, I'm ex-Navy, and I was a search and rescue diver, and so, you know, I'm swimming around, splashing around in the water, and my wife just does the weirdest thing. She just lays out in the surf, and just rides the surf. Now, that just seems antithetical to me, but she looks like she was having a blast. But here I am, how about you? There's something about that that is about God. You don't have to persuade God that you're good or that you're worthy or you're deserving. God already loves you. It's just about walking into that. And oh, by the way, God already loves the person you hate the most. That's a God thing. Uzziah says, wow, man, I don't want anything from you. Just wow, look at you. You're just God all by yourself. You're just a genius. Yeah? In the Episcopal Church, we call that the prayer of adoration. In the back of the Book of Common Prayer, there are seven genres of prayer. Did you know that? Aren't we smart? We are very smart. There are seven genres of prayer. And what we see in this Isaiah reading and later on in the Gospel is adoration. You ever prayed an adoration prayer? What's your default prayer? For some, it's thanksgiving. For some, it's intercession. You pray for others. Yeah, for some of us, it's penitence. Oh, I've made another misstep, Lord. Right? That's all legitimate. But we don't pray nearly enough in our, lit in our liturgy, in our worship service, the prayer of adoration. God, I want nothing from you. I just say, wow. Psalm 8 says, uh, God, you hung the moon, the sun, the stars, and the planets in their courses. What am I that you are mindful of me? Wow, God. And then in that Isaiah lesson, we see the movement. You go from adoration, wow, God, and the response, the best response always, always is oblation, right? And so there's a direct connection between adoration and oblation. What is oblation? Oblation is, what a good God you are. I give myself away. What an un-American idea. We think my life is mine. Personal liberties we've been talking about. Interesting idea, not in the Bible. All that I am, all that I have, I give to you, O oh God. Not because you muscle it from me, not because you guilt it from me, not because you shame me into it, because the best thing I can do with my life is give it over to you, because you know best. You know best. 
Yeah. What would it be like for you to give yourself away? Give yourself to God's purposes. You know, I used to joke with people and say, if you're winning all the arguments when you argue with God, perhaps you ain't met God just yet. (laughs) You ought to be, a mature Christian ought to be losing some arguments with God. All right, God, I'll give it a try. And that's all Isaiah says. He doesn't know what the future holds. He just says, here I am, send me. And what I like about this is a wonderful, pretty little movement in here. He says, but Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. Now, there's a good corrective for us, isn't there? Because sometimes when you and I, we get a little bit of religion, we get a little haughty. Not you, of course, just me. We get a little bit politically correct, a little condescending. We are right, and y'all are wrong. Yeah? But Isaiah really show forth, I think, the, the fruit of real adoration, which is humility. When you've met God, you know that everybody is your sibling. I said everybody. For the back, everybody. There are two pieces in an abiding relationship with God that are irreducible, and that is the fact of God and the fact of neighbor. God is irreducible, and our neighborliness one to the other is irreducible. And so when I've actually met a loving God, that puts me beside all kinds of people, all kinds of people. We were talking a lot about our police and the tragic shooting of unarmed people in Atlanta. And I had a lot to say about that, and I learned something. And we should talk about that. Because it seems like one kind of person often gets killed in those exchanges. That's what it seems like nationally. But what I realized, that even though I was right about that, there was something deficient in my talking about it. You see, I had never spent any time with police officers. And so I signed up to do a ride-along with officers in our most tragic neighborhoods, a ride-along. And I began to learn about what it's like to be our uniformed officers and have to deal with it day after day for no money, with very little education and support. Now, my viewpoint did not change about unarmed shooting, about shooting of, of unarmed people. But now it's nuanced with a new sense of humanity for men and women who are trying to tend to this very complex issue. Isaiah gets sent out into the world to do that. Remember, partisanship for us of any sort is beneath the gospel. It's beneath it. We are partisans for one, and that's God alone, which puts me beside all kinds of people. All that happened in that memory from Isaiah. Let's tend to the gospel just a minute before we wrap up. The gospel lesson starts off with once, once. When's your last once? When's the last time you had that fleeting knowing that you knew, that you knew, that you knew that God is real? Go back to that this week at some point because that's what's gonna sustain you at the next difficult intersection. Because sometimes we don't have all the answers in the windshield but we have the comfort of knowing that God was just recently in the rearview mirror. And that's what drives us forward. Peter, Simon Peter was exhausted, frustrated in the real world. His fishing business, I mean, have you ever paying attention to the gospel lesson at all? These people are the worst fishermen who ran up fishing. <laughs> they are terrible. I have never, am I reading, am I reading that wrong? I have never read a, a gospel lesson where they say, boy, we're just kicking fish butt out here. We're just doing it, man. Thank you very much, Jesus. We've got this under control. I've never read that story. They're always frustrated by life. They never quite get there. And tonight's, today's gospel is no different. But here's what Peter, Simon Peter does, which I think is instructive for us. Amidst the frustration understandable, legitimate. Amidst all of that, he decides to do this amazing thing, which is really worship. He decides to trust Jesus' words even in the midst of his frustration. And that's a word to you and I. 
We're terribly frustrated, and legitimately so, aren't we, about lots of things. There's a great malaise over the country. I just drove from Long Beach, California, to Marietta, Georgia, to drove 40 east right across. It's no wonder contempt is winning in our nation. People are disaffected. They're destroyed by the economy right now. There's no hope in a lot of places. So contempt at least is something I can hold on to, even though it's terribly corrosive to everything and everyone. Yeah? So we've got to just sort of move forward, and we move forward how we worship Jesus, the God of love made flesh, even in the midst of our frustration. Sometimes we're waiting for a fax or an email or a Twitter from Jesus. None, nothing's coming, friends. We've got to trust. And this is what we get to say in places like this. We say amidst all the frustrations in this world that God is trustworthy. That's what we do together. In song, in sacrament, and in word, we say God is trustworthy. Imagine what happens to Isaiah, James, John, and Simon Peter when they leave. Imagine you tomorrow, having had your once, having had your sort of know that you know that you know. What do you do the next day? What do you change? What do you heal? Who do you connect with? Who do you bless? Who do you ask for forgiveness? Who do you extend forgiveness to? So that's what all of this is about. What is church at the end of this? Church is just a glorified Chevron station. Fuel up for the journey. And that's how the gospel finishes. After this adoration, after this oblation, after meeting a trustworthy God in the midst of frustration, they are sent out sent out to make a difference in the real world. And how? By enlarging Jesus' friend-making campaign. And that's our charge, to increase the celebrity of Jesus Christ in the real world. What a privilege. Amen.